One of the things that everyone here has commented on, like when I speak to people, I say, oh, like what is it about the a festers that you love? We say it's like a high quality of human, but like what does that mean? And someone was explaining to me last night, they're like, everyone here is just so awake. Like I look in their eyes and they're right there. And I know it's like you go back to life and people do seem like they're kind of sleepwalking, you know? And everyone here is like, hi! And didn't I tell you, so day three, everyone would be like sparkle eyes, right? And like this is everyone here now is like sparkle eyes. And there's something in that awakened quality. And that is about to jump to a whole nother level because our next speaker, Dr. Shafali, specializes in this radical awakening. Yes. And for those of you who don't know Dr. Shafali, she is a three times New York Times bestselling author. She holds a doctorate in clinical psychology from Columbia. You know, Oprah endorsed her work as on conscious parenting as like absolutely revolutionary. And uh, she specializes in merging Eastern and Western philosophy. Now, previously she's done a lot of work in the conscious parenting space, and this next evolution is taking everything she has learned and her own incredible experience and into this space now of helping people to radically awaken to their best selves and manifesting their highest possible potential. And so it's with great pleasure and in the interest of everyone in this room, please welcome Dr. Shafali. <laughs> So when we were deciding what I should talk about, I will let you know that the organizers told me, you cannot talk about parenting because this crowd is a bit too wild and I don't know whether they're ready for conscious parenting. <laughs> so I was like, okay, then I'll talk about sex. And they were like, no, that topic has been taken and these people are wild in sex anyway. So I'm like, okay. My two favorite topics have been taken. This is not fair. So like, what should I talk about? So let's see. <laughs> Thank you all for having me here and uh, being such an enthusiastic, uh, warm receptor of my message. And I always love coming to Mind Valley because of this warmth that I get. So I appreciate all of it. So a mother once came to me with her infant. The infant was around 13 months old. And she was an anxious mother, as most mothers are, and uh, she wanted to fix this child and produce this perfect baby so she could post about the baby on social media. <laughs> However, the baby had its own agenda, how dare it. And the baby refused to bend to her will. In fact, according to her, the baby was non-reactive, was not connecting, was not making eye contact. So she had all these pamphlets, you know. Is my, do is my daughter ASD, autism spectrum disorder? Is she RAD, reactive attachment disorder? You know, we're really good at uh, diagnosing other people. So. I knew in my gut and with all the work I've done that it cannot be that a child that young has got so many psychiatric issues. So what is the issue? What is the real core problem here? So as I began to observe the mother and uh, the mother at one point began to feed the baby, uh, I began to observe the interaction. And by golly, the mother was right. Every time the mother would put a spoon in this wretched child's mouth, this child had the audacity to look away. And then the mother would do helicopter swirls and swings and gymnastics and acrobatics because the mother was being so humiliated in front of me and she was like, can you please bloody eat the spoon of whatever honey I'm giving you? But nope, the child refused. The mother happened to leave the room to get something, my office, and. I was for a moment left with this thing. And I was like, don't leave me with this thing. <laughs> However, the baby's affect, temperament, attitude, all shifted when I was alone with this thing. <laughs> she lit up. She looked at me. And I was like, what are you doing? Like, who are you? And don't do this, like, you're so fake. Like, who's, what's the real you? So I was like, no, no, your mother's coming back. Go back to the old, like, who you just were. 
So when the mother came back, again, the baby shifted in affect. When I began to explore the mother's history, you know, we don't have to go too far back to discover what the issue in the present moment is. She began to tell me about her alcoholic father and how he had abandoned them and how for years and decades she feared being left alone. So her defense was to crust herself in a shell of protection, as is often our defense. So now as a mother, she was unable to connect. I knew then that my mission wasn't to diagnose this thing. It had nothing to do with this thing and all to do with the pain that this mother was carrying, unbeknownst even to her. She genuinely thought there was something wrong with the other. After working with her and slowly melting away her defenses, the mother's authentic self began to light up and their relationship vastly improved. Pan to another house, a three-year-old, is being yelled at by her mother. The mother thinks she's right, she's righteous, that if she doesn't correct the child's behavior right here, right now, the child will be a drug addict and a criminal. So the mother is putting all her effort to fix this child's bad behavior. And then the mother notices in the most subtle of ways that this child begins to wither and wilt and droop. And the mother sees right before her eyes that this child's light begins to diminish. That mother was me. And I was the one stamping out the light. I knew that my mothering was in desperate trouble. But how could it be, I wondered, or my ego wondered. I had a PhD. I had big boobs, big hips. <laughs> I had three masters, and I had been meditating. How could this be? Maybe it was my mother-in-law. Maybe it was the child. Could it be me? And the brutal, transparent, honest truth was that it was. It was me. And when I confronted this in myself, there was the birth of my mission here in conscious parenting. Because I realized what no one had told me. No one had told me that I would not be raising my child. I would be reenacting all my emotional crap. No one told me that. Did anyone tell you that? Did your parents tell you that you are the result of their emotional crap? <laughs> no, because no one thinks like that because we parents are amazing. So, to acknowledge, to confront, to reckon with the monster of my ego when my daughter was barely knee high was a huge turning point in my life where I realized that parents are not told that until they raise themselves, all they will be doing is projecting their unmet needs, expectations, fantasies onto their children. So you hear a child of your parents, are you really authentically you? Or have you been all this while simply a mere puppet of your parents' fantasies? I knew right then in that moment that if I did not take my ego in charge and tame it and tame it, I would do unto my child what had been done to me. And I would not raise her for her authentic spirit, but instead maneuver and manipulate and coerce her till she was a reflection of my greatest fantasy. And of course, the greater the inner void, the greater the manipulation. So it is with all of us. You see, when we came into this earth, we came as pure as we could be. Of course, with an essence and a temperament and a fire and an energy. But we came as unconditioned as we could be. But little known to us that while we were in the belly of the beast, 
our future was being reckoned. It wasn't just being dreamt about. It was being nuanced on a prescription list so detailed, so numbered, going up to 1,000 minimum. Our fate was sealed. Our name, our religion, how we would be, what kind of girl, what kind of career, all of it was taking place not in our life, but in the fantasy life of our parents. But we had no idea. So when we were born, we came innocent, ready, ready, ready to trust that we would be able to manifest who it is we authentically were. This was the trust we gave our caregivers. We did not know that we were about to be used and abused and manipulated and maneuvered and puppeteered. We had no idea. And step by step and skin by skin, here we were masterfully curated in our parents' museum. And what happens through this process where we are clay given to another who is unconscious, this is a deadly process indeed. The essence that we came with, our sense of worth in who it is we were, unconditioned, is now at peril. It is at stake. It is going to be pillaged, marauded, threatened, abducted, all before the age of two. And so it was for us all. And if our parents were neglectful and kind of smoking something, don't worry. The aunties would do it, and the neighbors would do it, and culture was right there. So the child, the innocent, the unconditioned, had not one chance to live an authentic life. So it is with us all, conditioned and in false self. We grew up puppeteering ourselves to the whims and fancies of the external other, be it the parent, the teacher, the God, the culture. And when we do this, when we give up who it is we are and what could never even discover, couldn't even stay planted, rooted in who it is we are, what happens is we maneuver the external personality, the false sense of self, according to whatever it is that will give us the crumbs of love, worth, approval, and validation. Give me love. Do you see me? Do you see me? Who am I? You tell me. Because our ability to ground ourselves in our authenticity was robbed. You see, our parents will say, but, because, but I love you. I only did it because I wanted you to be happy. We parents love to say that. Everything we do is because we love our children. To make them happy. <laughs> but then we tell them, well, I was freaking miserable. And you're like, no, 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 you weren't that miserable. You were happy a few times a week, like me. And so it is, our false sense of self becomes robust. That is the voice that is watered because that is the voice that gives us the love, you see? So wherever we can buy it, that's what we water, that's what grows, that what, that's what blossoms. And we don't even realize it's a false sense of self because it is so our second skin. It is the only way we know how to get worth. So we search, we look, always looking for the next prey or predator, depending on our equation with ourselves, to feel a sense of worth. Sometimes we are the prey, because that makes us feel worthy. Sometimes we're the predator, because that gives us significance. It doesn't matter, both emerge from the false sense of self. So now, now that we understand that perhaps we all could be living a persona, we all could be trying to buy worth, if you really pay attention to yourself all day and the decisions and choices you make, I can guarantee you, barely one will be for your authentic self. Most are tailored for the eyes and approval of the other. So, this is where the journey of consciousness begins. In the awareness, in the epiphany, in the brutal shakening of your understanding that you have been in false self. Until that happens, we are all simply asleep. 
Life is beautiful in that way. It will wake us all up. Because the ego, you see, that false self can only last so much. There are only so many pennies in the pocket that we can spend on love and worth. Eventually, we will hit rock bottom. As a therapist, I wait for rock bottom. I know, so perverse, so sadistic. But why do I wait for rock bottom? Because I know with humility the rigid ardor of the ego. And when I see the ego in the room, I know I am no match for that ego. Oh, but Dr. Shafali, I want to change. Uh-huh, ego. Uh-huh. Change whom? Change your kids. Change your weight. Change your face. Change your age. Change what? Ah, you want to change ego. Ego never wants to change. Because in order for the ego to change, the ego must die. So when the ego says to me, Dr. Shafali, I want to change, I go, hmm. But because life cannot tolerate the false self past midlife. How many of you have hit your mid-40s? Two people, okay. <laughs> For those who haven't, what you have to look forward to is the midlife crisis. When you've done the partner, you've done the cars, you've done the Botox, you've done child number one, two, three, husband number two, you swung him in there, and you still are at point zero. That's the beauty of midlife. Nothing worked. Nothing made you happy. And now we call it a crisis. But it is a crisis of the soul. It is a cry of your authentic self waiting to be discharged. It can only happen when there's enough crap in your life. And when everything falls apart. Typically for the mother, it's when her kid becomes that thing called a teenager. And then she goes from being the most adored creature on the planet to barely a chauffeur. When that transition happens, that she is now just a mother and not mommy, that is her potential to awaken. For the man, maybe around the age of 80. <laughs> Nature, nature is kind to us women. It knows what we've gone through. You awaken early, nature says to the woman. It's your time. For the men, let them awaken later. So we have a planet of very awakened women and men. At Mind Valley, at Mind Valley, of course, it's so different. We get a different kind of man here. So to awaken, to awaken is to destroy the ego. When the ego hits rock bottom, that is your rock bottom. Life is never hitting rock bottom. Life is just life. Life is just life, but what's hitting rock bottom is your ego. And when it splinters into pieces, shards on the floor, that is when your greatest potential is about to arise. But most of us run away from it. We're scared because we know now is the painful birthing canal that you have to go through and endure in order to come to the other side. And those around you who know you well and who are comfortable with your ego because they are in theirs, they tell you, don't, 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 don't. Don't listen to Dr. Shivali. Don't read that book. Don't go to Mind Valley because you will come out different and I won't recognize you. And then what will my ego do without you? So it's a dangerous canal, that birth tube. It is dangerous. And you enter it knowing that on the other side will be an unrecognizable new self. This is what it means to awaken, to realize that who it is you were and want to leave behind is a false, inauthentic part of you that was merely trying so sweetly, so desperately. The ego is cunning but desperately sweet. Because all it wants is love, is approval, is significance. It doesn't realize, you see, that it can never be achieved on the outside. It's a little immature. But it's not at fault. It was developed when you were young. How can the ego know better? So it develops childish techniques. Drinking a bit too much, like many of us were doing two nights ago. <laughs> Things like that. 
anger, it fights, it projects, it yells because it feels significant. Or it fixes things, it controls, it hyper-manages, or it withdraws, or it fakes it, looks like a star on social media. Whatever it takes to feel significant, it will do. But when we realize that these patterns are the patterns of the false self, now we begin to pay attention. So there are three ways that you can identify when you are in your false self. People always ask me, but how do I know I'm inauthentic when I'm always inauthentic? <laughs> That's authentic to me, Dr. Shivali. I'm most authentic when I'm completely a fake. Every day I wake up and I put on a mask. Are you telling me I can't do that anymore? So how do we become aware and awake about our unconscious self? How do we become conscious of something we're unconscious about? Well, they're clues. Our psyche has ways because our spirit or whatever you want to call that authentic self wants to be woken up, wants to be stirred. So there are ways. So the first way you get to know that you are an authentic self is the first C I'm going to talk about. We customize everything. So when things happen, of course, it's only happening to us. When cancer knocks on your door, you say, why me? When your husband philanders, you go, I knew it, I knew it. When something happens, when your kid is dyslexic, autistic, ill, you're like, how could this happen to me? Me, 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 I, I, I. Every sentence, every fantasy begins with your personal attachment to yourself. How many times in a day you think you say the word I, 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 I want, I wish, even if you're saying I wish for you, I want for you, I, 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 the attachment is because this is our conditioning to customize, to personalize every experience. The next thing we do is we make chronicles. Ask any man how good the memory of his female partner is. She has chronicled everything. Journals are in every drawer. Every detail has been documented. Nothing has been forgotten. Such is the female brain. But so it is with all of us. We chronicle, you see? We live in the past. The past creates stories for us. And these stories determine our present and our future. You know, every time, I, I see with parents all the time, when their kid is like three years old and like reading a little slowly, they're immediately thinking that their kid is going to be, you know, the worst student, a loser, not get a job, never get married. He's going to live with me for the rest of his life. Because we create chronicles. We create stories that go far into the future. And then the third thing we do, and we are masters at doing this, we catastrophize everything. Everything is doom. Everything is an interminable danger, disaster, trauma. Because we foretell, you see, we think we're psychic. We think we can see far into the future and it's always bad. We wouldn't be having the uprising of mental illness that we do today. We wouldn't even really be in this room much if we didn't do this thing called catastrophizing. Most mental health professionals like me count on you to catastrophize, okay? Keep catastrophizing. Because you catastrophize, you come to me. Imagine a place in your mind where you saw beauty in your future. That's not our nature. Our nature is to live in this primal survival, but we act like that right now, that there's not enough food, not enough water, not enough resources in the now. So catastrophe is imminent. So we customize, we make everything personal. It's not about community, it's about me, me, me. That's the first error in entering ego, in entering lack. Ego is always about me, the self, the I, it's personal. If it wasn't personal, it wouldn't be ego. And if it wouldn't be ego, we would not have a problem. The second thing we do is we make chronicles. Now we make a story. 
One thing happened to us 20 years ago, that's it. It's still living within us right now. And it'll live into the future. We're good at that. And then we create judgments of bad, bad. This is bad, this is good. This is good, this is bad. Because our mind has been conditioned to create categories. So we catastrophize. So now once we know why we get into ego, because we do these things repetitively, chronically, consistently, now what do we do about it? Okay, Dr. Shwali, okay, yes, you're right. I customize everything. I make everything personal. Okay, are you telling me I'm always going to be this way? Is it me? Is it always me? Is it only me? Are other people like this? And the client customizes and catastrophizes and creates stories while she's asking me what she should do about it. So how do we snap out of it? How do we get out of it? And this is where you turn to wisdom. Once you become aware of what your mind is doing and what your mind keeps doing, when your child comes to you, you don't look at your child as a sovereign being. When your partner comes to you, you don't see them as an independent authority on their own spirit. You're constantly looking at them only, only in relationship to you. How do you feel about it? What do you think about it? This is our nature. And it is because of this we create separation. It is because of this that the wars and violence continues because each person on the other side of the fence has deeply personalized, customized, catastrophized, and chronicled their experience. And it is superior to the others. This is the danger of our mind. And if you don't understand this about your own mind, you will keep doing it. Maybe you're sitting here going, no, I don't customize. I don't ever customize. I'm amazing. Because ego will never let you see its sneaky, manipulative ways. Because ego wants to stay there. But having worked with hundreds and hundreds of parents and adults and kids, I can tell you that if you don't recognize this pattern in your own mind, especially when you enter crisis, you won't break out of it. So the first step of awakening is awareness. Awareness of what? What are we becoming aware of? We're very aware of everyone else's problems. We can diagnose everyone in our lives. So what are we becoming aware of? Only one thing. We are becoming aware of our own conditioning. In order to awaken, you have to disrupt the patterns of your own conditioning. You, it's only your experience that works against you. It's only you who are your greatest enemy and your greatest lover and your greatest companion. There is no other. The other is created in your mind. So if you don't understand the patterns you fall into, you can't break out of it. So in order to break out of the pattern, in order to disrupt the pattern, in order to be the generational disruptor in your family, you need to be a bold spiritual seeker. And for this, there is no one bolder, no one a better teacher, at least in my opinion, than the Buddha himself. The Buddha taught a way out of these three things I talked about. The Buddha speaks to the disruption of patterns. So how do we break out of personalizing everything? Well, the Buddha had an answer. The Buddha taught us that your personalization of your experience comes from your delusion. Your experience of everything as coming from the eye comes from your ignorance. I know the Buddha was so rude, no? So belittling. Well, he just told it like it was. The root cause of suffering, he said, is our mental delusions, our ignorance. Ignorance of what? Of our own conditioning. So he said, if you understood that there is nothing in the world, nothing here in this material world that exists independently, you did not come here independently. You came <laughs> from your fucked up parents and then they from theirs, and the legacy continues. Nothing exists independently, he said. It is our failure to understand that everything is intimately interconnected that makes us have the delusion, the audacity to think there's an I, 
an independent sense of self. There is no independent you. There is no you. So all the ways you've been talking about, ah, I am a doctor, I'm an author, I'm, an, I'm going to Mind Valley, you know, I'm turning 35. That I, that I that you attach to doesn't exist because the I is never independently existing. It is always through cause and effect and cause and effect and cause and effect. Now, wh why do we need to know this? You're like, why? I like just knowing that I was an I, why do I need to know that I'm not an I? Well, you need to know that you're not an I because your attachment to your I is causing all the havoc in your life. So when you have the awareness that this I that you're crying about, he left me, he called me fat, he said I'm stupid, she doesn't like me. All those references you're making to yourself is about a being that doesn't exist. So in wisdom traditions, we call the difference between this reality and our conscious reality as the difference between your form and your formless. And because we are delusional and full of ego, we have forgotten our formless existence. We only attach to this material existence. So the Buddha taught that the key to your liberation is to understand there is no personal sense of self. Nobody can insult you because the person they're insulting doesn't exist. It only exists in their own projection. So you're getting insulted by somebody who doesn't even see you because they can never insult you because if they really knew you, they would know you don't exist. So every cast aspersion on you, everyone who's cast an insult on you, everyone that's thrown a scorn and a derision on you and told you you are lesser than, is really working out of their own ego. Because you truly, in your essence, can never be lesser than. You're not existing, you are nothing, you are not greater, you're not lesser. You are simply, in colloquial terms, energy, essence, consciousness. Yeah, in this form-based world you are, but this is not your entire reality. So when you are aware and in touch and one, one part of your being is in the awareness that there is this formless reality, a reality where in truth you are never an independent self, sense of self, that you are co-created constantly. So the person who's telling you you're fat, ugly, and stupid is co-creating that reality. And therefore, you can give those insults back to them because they have co-created it. They don't belong to you. Nobody can see you for who it is you truly are because no one is seeing themselves for who it is they truly are. If they understood that they are not a self, that they don't have a self, they would never say that they know about yourself. Only the wise truly understand that the self we refer to is empty. The Buddha called it no self. The wisdom of no self. So when you understand the wisdom of no self, you don't really, really take things personally. Sure, you can get insulted and like be all gossipy and say something nasty back on social media. But when, you're, when you come back into your wise self, you know this is all a game. It's an illusion. The Buddha then gave the answer to the second thing we do with our mind, which is to chronicle everything. The Buddha had an answer. He had a remedy. He had a cure, a salve. He said, when you understand that life is only lived in the now, there is no chronicle. There is no need for memory. There is no need for a story. There is no future. If there's one thing that COVID taught me is the wisdom of no future. There is no future. Now you can plan and apply for your visa and go to Portugal, sure, maybe it'll happen. But don't count on it, COVID has taught me. There is no future. The wisdom of the monks is to understand what the pandemic has freely given us if we're willing to look at the lesson. It has freely given you the lesson that monks will spend decades trying to teach you. The lesson that there is no future. There is no future. It only exists in your imagination. 
Because in order for that future to come about, do you know how many, how many, how many nows you have to go through? And each now is influenced by the cause and effects of millions of our nows because we're all interconnected. So the audacity to think you can predict the future comes from your own immature ignorance of a three-year-old. Even a three-year-old is wise to know to live in the now. Look at our children, how wise they are. They are in the now, not attached to the future. They live completely here because there is no future. So if you want to plan and if you want to, uh, you know, have vision boards, laugh while you do it at yourself. <laughs> it would be wise of you to laugh at your ego as you cut the Bentley and put it on the vision board and the cliff and the house overlooking it into the Pacific. Just laugh and put ego. <laughs> you can have fun doing it. But don't be beguiled thinking that there is a future waiting for you. All of what is waiting is only here now. And the now just finished. Oh my goodness, it just left. Did you see that now just go? It just went. And now we are here again in the next now and the next now. And the audacity of the spiritual seeker is to live in that edge of the now. And every time the mind of the ego says, come, 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 sweetheart. Don't listen, don't listen to those people. I'll show you the future, I know the future. Come, and remember the past, what happened 12 years ago? Let's live there. Why are we living in the now? Let's live back in the closets of our past. You have to be brave to cut the cord and say, no, I refuse to be seduced by the past or the future because I am a warrior of the present moment. And then the Buddha had an answer for the third problem of our mind where we catastrophize and judge and we call this good and that bad. He called it the principle of non-duality. And he said that our dukkha, our suffering, comes from our ignorance that we think the world is dual. It, there's a you and there's a me. There's a good and there's a bad. There's a rich and there's a poor. And all of us know which side we want to go on. And our whole life is striving to just get to the other side. But there is no other side because the other side is colored by this side. Because everything is interconnected and part of the other. Nothing can exist without the other's existence. You cannot know hot without knowing cold. You cannot know rich without knowing poor. You cannot know happiness without knowing sadness. They are part of the same experience. So to want one is to be in denial, that you can only experience one with the other. When parents come to me and say, I just want my kid to be happy, I just, I just, only Dr. Shvali, I don't want my kid to be a doctor or a multimillionaire and buy me a lovely house. No, I don't want that. I just want my kid to be happy. When they say that, they think that they are being righteous. But I know parents too well by now. I go, mm-hmm, this is all about you. You want them to be happy because you believe there is a thing called happiness and you believe that if they are happy, that means you're a good parent because you believe there's such a thing as a good parent because there's certainly bad children, so there must be bad parents. But when you understand that all of it are just labels coming from your own relative experience and none of those labels are real and all of it is non-dual, there is no duality, you begin to uncover the roots of your mental ignorance, our mental ignorance. So the conditioning of our mind is deadly and it starts from our childhood. And before we even come out into the world, our parents have given us lists after lists after lists, prescriptions, check boxes of what to believe, how to be good, how to be rich, how to be successful. And the list goes on and on because that's their belief that you will become a successful and happy adult. Have a miserable childhood, but please just be happy and successful when you grow up. <laughs> because I was a failure, you see. So you, you become a better version of me. <laughs> version 1.0 wasn't so good, but I think version 2.0 is going to be better. So we put all our effort into version 2.0, making our children something we were never. 
all because we think there's a future, we believe that they can be happy, and we believe in the myth of success. So these belief systems, you see, they contort and convolute and contaminate our thinking. And we can't find our authentic self. We try, we go to therapists, we go to spiritual seekers, we go to, you know, dip in the River Jordan, hoping to emerge more authentic. But what we don't realize, there is no seeking on the outside. There's nothing we need to look for. All we need to do is uncover, unshed, let go, undo, unlearn all that is contaminating us. There's nothing to add. We don't have to add. I always say growth is not additive. Growth is, growth is a subtractive process. It is a process of emptying, discarding, destructing, destroying, disrupting, letting go. Of what? Of what? Of all the false beliefs that we grew up with. If you look at the word belief, the word believe, all of them have a deadly three-letter word in there. Who can tell me what it is? Well, the I is a deadly one-letter word, but there's a deadly three-letter word in there. To lie. And if you break apart the word believe, and you take out that middle E, now you're talking about B, live. But when you put that E, which I call the E of the ego, which is the lies we've been told by culture, because culture's ego is stronger than any one of ours. That E changes everything, and culture lies to us through its beliefs, through its belief system, by telling you what to believe. Because when you believe, you're not in the present moment. You're not in the here and now. You just believe. The Buddha called Nirvana, the ultimate awakening, as the extinction of all beliefs. The cause of violence in the world today, the one who starts the war, believes they are right, believes they are superior. No one does anything believing they're evil. <laughs> they will never say that. The ego never acknowledges its stealth, its manipulation, its domination. It always tells the person, you are right. Believe in yourself. They are wrong. All violence occurs because of what the person believes. And most of those beliefs are lies. Lies coming from a false ego of culture, an ego that causes separation and not interdependence. So if you want to break the patterns of your I, your attachment to yourself, then you need to do the work. People come and ask me, what is the work? You know, I'm so good. I go on a run every day. I cleanse. I'm vegan. What do you mean by the work?